And we're back. Hello and welcome to ReadZ Live, ReadZ's ongoing series of webinars where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing to show you how to write and publish better books. Uh, today, my guest is Paul Bradley Carr, an author who we have had on ReadZ Live before. He's a memoirist and a debut novelist who uh, dropped his first novel last year. He may talk a bit about that, uh, but mostly we are here to talk about memoirs and specifically how to make uh, your memoir one that is one with uh, commercial viability or, or not. Uh, we'll sort of get into that in a little bit. Uh, while we're waiting for Paul to join us, like a little bit behind the curtains, he's already with us, but I'm not bringing him on for a few minutes. Just say hello, where are you from? Uh, it's good to see uh, where everybody's hailing from right now. I uh, see Sue from Australia in uh, her PJs. Fantastic. Uh, I wish I was as well at this point. Catherine from London. Hey. Oh, oh by the way, if you're not familiar with me, I'm Martin uh, from the London team here at Readsy. Uh, Readsy is a publishing network that joins up authors with the best publishing talent in the world, maybe. Um, that's editors, designers, ghostwriters, marketers. If you need people to help you publish your book, uh, we're here. Head to readsy.com uh, and check us out. But uh, we're going to bring on our guest in just a few minutes and we'll be talking about uh, how to make uh, a memoir with commercial potential. Uh, for those of you uh, in the comments, let's see, uh, someone's asked whether this will be available later and the answer is yes. Uh, with this very page here on YouTube, you can come back to it anytime uh, and rewatch it. Also, uh, if you go to Read Z Live's website, uh, we'll be adding a transcript there in coming days. So. Uh, if you're unable to follow or you prefer to read stuff, uh, that is your option. Uh, let's see. Uh, Third Act Journey says uh, it won't let you accept the e Discord invite. Uh, as we've posted in the comments there, we've set up a Discord recently where you're able to go in and chat to folks afterwards. I think I tested it to make sure it's okay. If anyone else hasn't joined it yet, uh, give it a go and see if that link I've posted uh, at the top of the comments works. It's also in the video description. Uh, basically, you can chat here in the chat box, uh, but if you want to keep it going with everyone else, uh, you can head there and uh, keep the conversation going afterwards. We have Sandra from Ohio, uh, Larry from Miami, uh, Jackie from Glasgow, uh, Terry uh, from Alabama, fantastic, Jim from Oregon. It's great to see so many people. Uh, I'd also love to know uh, who's working on a memoir. Paula says she's just started working on her memoir. Good to hear. Uh, Michael Lewis from New York. The author of The Big Short. Fantastic. So, so pleased to see you here. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, Michael Brown uh, from Mexico. Uh, Tilu from Dallas. Okay. We've got a lot of people joining. All good news. Um, so, uh, first things first, a uh, bit of housekeeping. Uh, as I mentioned before, a transcript will be available later. If you signed up on Eventbrite, I'll send you an email telling you how to get there. Otherwise, go to Readsy Live's website, blog.readsy.com slash live, and you can see like dozens of previous webinars and their transcripts. Uh, that'll be great. Julie's working on a memoir. Uh, Change for the memoir. Uh, Change for the better's working on a memoir. Cindy's working on a memoir. Twyla's memoir. Stephanie memoir. Uh, fantastic. Terry memoir. A lot of people working on their memoirs. Very good news. Uh, okay, so I've noticed that it's just two minutes past the hour. That's eight o'clock here in the UK, 3 p.m. on the East Coast, noon on the West Coast. Uh, I'm going to bring on my guest for today. Please welcome Paul Bradley Carr. Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, thanks, Martin. Uh, sounds like a lot of people from a lot of uh, very exciting places. I'm here in Palm Springs, California, where it is insanely warm uh, and delightful. So um, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe Alabama, Florida, and and uh, Australia are warmer. I, I think maybe I have Glasgow <laughs> beat in temperature. Uh, like that? Uh, are um, you? Have you turned the AC off uh, for the benefit of the webinar? Have you got some sort of cooling system going on? Oh, I've got the, there's, there's air conditioning. No, if you turn the air conditioning off in Palm Springs, you die in about 30 seconds. It's, <laughs> it's a bit like the oxygen in the space station. So that's never a good idea. I think my, my, my Florida folks can probably relate. Um, so no, it is the, the air conditioning is pumping away. So I'm all, I'm all ready to go. So any sweat you see is just simply the, uh, the uh, anxiety of not wanting to give anybody any bad advice and, and making sure I give I, I, I share some useful tips on this on this webinar. Oh, good because I've got my finger poised on the eject button, and as soon as like there's a whiff of bad advice, uh, we'll, we'll we'll end this thing. Uh, well, oh, let's see if we can get past the five minute mark. Er Berger says it's a dry heat emphatically. 
It is a dry, it is emphatically a dry heat. No, I used to live in Las Vegas the same. Um, oh yes, of course it's cold in Australia now. Sorry, um, <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry, I didn't mean to rub it in. Well, it's delightful here, so uh, you're welcome, Palm Springs, <laughs> anytime. Um, anyway, uh, so yes, I'm very very happy to be here and very uh, pleased to hear everybody is uh, working on memoirs. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised because that's what we're talking about. Um, yeah, but but it's great, uh, great to hear. Oh, it turns out Michael Lewis is not the Michael Lewis I was hoping. I had so, a feeling. I had so, a feeling when you when you said that. I thought it's interesting that Michael Lewis, the the sort of um, one of the most successful nonfiction writers of all time, would be thinking. I wonder how to write a commercially successful memoir. I bet Paul Bradley Carr has something interesting to say on the topic. Well, um, but Michael yes, might be one of these guys. I, Michael might be one of these guys who just turns up to webinars and starts uh, throwing his name around to, for a bit of clout. Yeah, that's that sounds like Michael Lewis. Actually, it probably <laughs> is him. Pretending it's not him, but we all know it really is. Um, so, all right. So, uh, shall we shall we get cracking? Are you yeah, ready? Yeah, to... let's do that. I'm just going to make a, a first appeal for everyone to like and subscribe this video. Uh, there's 44 likes so far and 500 people here, so we can get that number up. Uh, I'll check back in if there are insufficient likes on this. So you'll hear from me later in the webinar. Uh, but Paul, I'll be back uh, towards the end uh, for a Q and A. So if you have any questions there at home, uh, save them up. Uh, and uh, we'll try to ask them whenever. I'll, I'll try to keep a track of them. Uh, if you need anything, Paul, let me know. Otherwise, see you at the end. I'll be right here. Uh, all right. Thank you, Martin, very much. And thank you, everybody, for for being here. I'm very excited um, to, to be here. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, yes, I, um, I'm uh, very keen to, to sort of share what I've learned uh, in, in the, uh, about the world, the exciting world of writing uh, memoirs. So before I get into all of that, I should... Uh, give a bit of background because unlike Michael Lewis, um, I'm not a globally famous uh, nonfiction writer. So in the in the chance that you have never heard of me and heard of any of my work, um, my name is uh, Paul Bradley Carr. Um, I um, have uh, written and uh, had published, goodness, uh, maybe 14 books now, um, of which three were memoirs. Uh, two of them were published by big, um, big publishers. Um, so uh, a couple of them here. Um, but I'm not trying to sort of promote those, so I'll just put them away. Um, but um, two uh, two were written, by, uh, two were published by by big uh, sort of pub publishers, parts of Hachette, and then um, one was published by a, a, a smaller independent publisher. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I've 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 learned a lot about writing memoir as as a memoir writer. But I've also been a uh, I've also been a publisher myself. I've run a couple of different publishing houses. Uh, one in the UK, one here in the US, um, and I've also uh, and and during that time we published a, a decent amount of memoir, um, and then uh, I'm also an avid reader of memoir. So I come I come at it from all different angles as someone who's written memoir, someone who's published memoir, and and then also someone who's who who loves memoir. So um, so that's that's sort of my bona fides and, and where I'm coming from. Um, but I, I want to give a couple of sort of caveats of. Um, I'm not somebody who currently actively publishes memoir. I'm not someone who's going to be able to publish your memoir. Uh, but equally, um, anybody who tells you that they have the secret of what's going to be the next big memoir is, is lying. It's, it's much like with anything in publishing, anything in media. Um, there's a lot of people just doing their best at, at guessing what the market is going to like. And so I don't want nothing I say should put you off writing your, your story and if you at any point uh, think, no, he's just wrong. Uh, my memoir isn't like anything he's describing, uh, but it's going to be a huge hit. You may well be right. Every single book I've published um, and pitched has been rejected by at least one publisher, sometimes many dozens. Um, and and they've all been published by someone else. So uh, just, just want to get that out. And the other thing I want to say is I'm going to talk specifically um, today about commercially viable and commercially success uh, you know potentially commercially successful memoirs and the key word there is commercially the nothing i'm saying nothing i'm about to say should stop you writing your story uh one of the wonderful things about reedsy i'm a huge fan of reedsy i recently self-published a book in fact um and uh used reedsy for almost every part of the process but one of the amazing things about reedsy and the sort of self-publishing boom is nobody gets to tell you you can't write your own story so so what I'm going to talk about here is is what makes um, a commercially potentially commercially viable memoir, and how to know if the story you're writing might be one, and how also to hopefully optimize, um, for want of a less clinical word, 
your uh, your memoir to make to give it its best shot at finding a publisher well finding an agent finding a publisher and then finding an audience of readers at the at the other end so with all those caveats uh, out the way and all that sort of framing out the way um i want to i want to also uh, i want to start by sort of framing what we mean by by a memoir because it seems obvious um but uh, i recently started teaching a, a course an online course about um how to get published how to how to publish um how to self publish but also how to be commercially published and a lot of the people who took the course are writing memoir and what i realized early on is the there is a, a there is quite an amount of misunderstanding about what memoir is and what mem and what successful memoirs are and and part of that is um i want to clarify the difference between uh, the broad category of autobiography and the specific category of memoir and what i mean by that is a lot of people um a lot of people when they think of memoir they really are thinking of autobiography by which i mean they think of a story that starts when they were born and ends wherever they are now um whatever age they are now and that's the criticism you often hear when people you know see these sort of 25 year old 30 year old um writers getting deals to write memoirs and people say how can a 25 year old write their memoir they're only 25 they haven't even lived you know you write that when you're when you're dying and when you've lived an interesting life but the truth is that's uh, that's because that's an autobiography an auto to me anyway an autobiography is the story of your entire life a memoir and a successful memoir is generally very focused on a particular either a particular slice of your life or a particular theme of your life and that's what i'm really interested to talk about today and that to me is the biggest thing to understand if you're going to write a memoir that's going to be commercially successful is it isn't simply enough to sit down and write the story of your life because this is where the, the great thing about memoir is it's both the easiest and the hardest format to write in and by that i mean anybody everybody every one of us on this on this uh, webinar has a has a life and interesting things have happened to all of us sadly traumatic things have happened to all of us we've all lived through a lot of of that in the past few years of pandemic and other and other things um but that doesn't necessarily mean that it it makes for a good memoir and so uh, what I, I want to try and be as clear as I can when I'm talking about memoir, what, I'm, what, what I mean is uh, a book that tells a particular aspect of, or that shares a particular aspect of your life that will be helpful to others, um, that, will be, that, will, uh, that will tell a specific story that has a specific theme um, and, and that ideally can be, uh, can be applicable and helpful to others. So I'll give some specific examples from my um from my uh sort of back catalog and then yes we'll talk about what what makes specifically a good memoir so for example uh i wrote my first memoir when i was 27 years old um and objectively that's not old enough to write the story of my life but the story i wanted to tell was a very specific part of my life i had lived in my late 20s that is the story of a lot of people in their late 20s uh at, at that time this was gosh 15 years ago uh, where there was the big buzz around Web 2.0, and these all the, we saw these people like Mark Zuckerberg and others getting very rich at a very young age. And I was living in London, and I was an alcoholic. We'll get to that later because that's another memoir story for another memoir. Um, uh, drinking my way through London, um, writing about the uh, the technology world for for the Guardian newspaper, and I was spending a lot of time with these very rich, very young people both in the UK and then also in Silicon Valley. And I thought, I, I could do that. It's easy. I, I meet them. They're not that smart. They're quite smart, but they're not geniuses. Um, that's something you should know about most tech people is they're not as clever as you think. Um, and with the arrogance of youth and everything else, I thought I could do that. So I quit my sort of journalism job and decided I was going to build uh, the next big, big startup. And obviously during the course of that, I learned it's much harder than, than it looks. And I am not in any way, I was not in my 20s as an alcoholic. I've been sober for more than 10 years. But but in the time, I was not built for doing this. And so by the end of it, by the time it all came crashing down, I had a very specific story that I could tell about what it's like to be a sort of arrogant 20-year-old thinking you can be this next Mark Zuckerberg, which a lot of people were feeling, and actually how hard it is but also a story about addiction, a story about, um, you know, again, the arrogance of youth. Um, all of those things um, were, were applicable to lots of people, were relevant to lots of people, and I felt were a good enough story to tell, and, and a publisher agreed. Um, my next memoir was about um, 
uh, a time I spent living in hotels and I figured out a way to live in luxury hotels around the world for a very, uh, for, for less than it cost me to live in London. People who live in London can probably relate, but I figured out a system. My, my parents are hotel managers. I figured out a system to live in luxury hotels in London. Um, uh, sorry, out of London, uh, around the world for the price it cost me to live in London. Again, very specific story that that had then wider implications around freedom, around travel, around things that could resonate with other people. Uh, and then my third memoir was literally about quitting, uh, quitting drinking and how I did it without Alcoholics Anonymous. So the theme hopefully that you've picked up from all those is not one of those was the story about how I was born and, and you know, everything I did, where I went to school and anything else. Um, I'm not a celebrity. It may have escaped your attention, but I'm uh, I'm not a celebrity. And most of the people who write the best um, the best memoirs are not celebrities. And by contrast, most of the people who write the worst memoir slash autobiography are people who were given book deals simply because they were famous, but nobody thought to ask if they actually had an interesting story. So when we talk about then what makes a good memoir, the first thing to know and the first mistake I always see from people. Feel bad for Martin having to constantly update the thing as I jump back and forth. I apologize, Martin. Sorry, I, but, I anticipated um, it uh, too early. This is <laughs> it's fine. I do that on Zooms all the time. I'm like, oh, next slide, previous slide. Um, so um, the biggest, hopefully, the theme that you you get from this is um, yeah, lots of uh, very famous people get uh, get uh, book deals, and it turns out they don't have an interesting story to tell. So the biggest mistake I see, especially when I'm teaching the the course on getting published, or when I meet other writers, or when I was a publisher, were people who said. Um, I, I want to. I want to write a memoir. I've, I've, I think I'm a really good writer. I've, lots of interesting things have happened to me in my life, and I want to tell the story of all of them. And I have to unfortunately break it to people, as I had to break it to myself, that um, nobody cares about you. And I don't mean that. As I said that in a deliberately horrible way. And by that I mean, you have to give people a reason to care about you. You have to. You have to give people a reason to to relate to your story and for your story to resonate with them. So the first thing. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk, the first thing I, you know, that should be clear is what is the focus of your memoir? What specifically are you writing? And, and maybe some people can, I can't see the chat at the moment, but, and I, and that's good because it will distract me, but, but feel free if you want to in the chat, share what your specific story that you are, you are trying to tell is, because I'd love to talk about that in the Q and A, um, because, um, because, because yes, the number one thing is what specifically are, is the story you're trying to tell? Uh, the second thing I encourage people to um, uh, to, to think about is um, how will that story resonate with a wider audience? How will that story hit somebody where they currently are? Um, you know, without getting into too many specifics about the world at the moment, there are lots of people for various reasons walking around feeling very traumatized, very upset, very angry, very scared, very sad, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. And it is a big deal for somebody to give you the time um, out of their day, out of their week, out of their month to read your story. And the, 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 the memoirs that do the best are those that meet people where they are. It's not saying, oh, you've got to listen to my story because it's so interesting. I don't care. There are, I can turn on Netflix right now, Apple TV right now and see a thousand, a million interesting stories. But why right now in this moment do I want to read yours? And um, I was I was looking actually at uh, before we got on. I'm going to reach to my laptop here because I was looking at some um, some examples of the the current best selling memoirs. These are not memoirs in the long tail. These are selling incredibly well. Um, can uh, you know? Uh, full disclosure: I haven't read all of these, and I'm making no judgment on the quality of the book. But but I am saying these are currently sort of in the best selling uh, list, and I, I I pulled out a few. One is Bookends by uh, Zibby Owens, um, which is a book. It's a memoir of love, loss, and literature. But what it really is is it's a, a memoir of um, uh, of motherhood and of somebody who used uh, who who used books and reading as a way of learning uh, what it means to be a mother and how to uh, sort of succeed as a mother and and. And the trauma, I think a lot of, um, so my day job is I work, uh, I, I help um, my, my partner, Sarah, run a site called Chairman Me, which actually started out called Chairman Mom. It was a community for mothers. So this, uh, working mothers. So these book, this book resonated with me and it just hit me in terms of um, how, uh, how many of us can relate to this idea of when we feel like we're struggling, we reach for a book or we reach for literature, we reach for fiction 
and and reading as a way to try and help us understand the world. And a memoir of that just just grabbed me. I just thought I'm not a mom, or, you know, maybe obviously I'm not a mom, um, but it just grabbed me. And I and I can imagine how it immediately grabbed millions of other people who don't know who 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 Zibby Owens is, but immediately could could relate. And then another one I um John, I have to remind myself of the name. The Tender Bar was the other one that jumped out at me. I haven't read this. Uh, but it's very much on the opposite side of the the, the spectrum. It's a it's a memoir of masculinity, really, written by um, goodness me, I should have remembered this. Written by J. R. Moringa, um, Moringa. Sorry, I'm probably butchering his name. Um, but it's a memoir of a of a man who uh, grew up not knowing his father, but his father was uh, a radio DJ, and so he grew up listening to his father on the radio and not really knowing him. And then when his father passed away. Uh, he found the uh, new father figures at his local bar. And it's a very much a, a book, a memoir of the struggle of masculinity. And again, I don't know, I couldn't even pronounce this man's name. Um, maybe he's more famous than I know, but I've never heard of him. And I guarantee, I suggest a lot of people listening today haven't heard of him. But that story resonates of just like looking for male, male um, uh, sort of figures who who can who can be role models and and a lot of the struggles around sort of toxic masculinity things like that so so the second question once you've established what is the specific story and again this isn't a memoir about a guy's entire life it's a memoir of his struggle to find these father figures told through a very specific lens similarly um the book about motherhood through reading very specific but again with a very wide audience so i would uh, a very wide potential audience it resonates with people my book about living in hotels there weren't many people living in hotels when I wrote that book. There aren't many people living in hotels now. But the idea of wanting to escape, the idea of wanting freedom, the, the fascination with the, the world of luxury hotels and the dream of thinking, could I do that? Could I live that life? Does resonate, much like something like Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week. It resonates with people um, who, and it doesn't matter, they don't know or care about me. They, they you know, I'm, I'm well aware that most of the people who bought my books had no feelings about no no feelings good or, or bad about me when they bought that book, but hopefully by the end um, they 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 did, and they also hopefully felt differently about themselves, um, like any good uh, memoir. And then the the other sort of thing, especially more relevant now, is not only will your book resonate with people, will it help people? And I found this to be so key now is people really are feeling um, very lost, many people for a variety of reasons, and the. The memoirs, I think, that resonate with the market right now are ones that can help people navigate that uncertainty. So anything about health, anything about parenting, raising good children, um, obviously we're seeing a lot of memoirs now around um, sort of women's rights and, and um, you know, also a lot of memoirs about, about politics tearing families apart. These are all relatable, but they also are hitting, meeting people where they have problems that they are trying to navigate. My third memoir was about addiction. But it was specifically about addiction, about quitting drinking without Alcoholics Anonymous. And still to this day, I mentioned at the beginning, that was the memoir that got that that was published by an independent publisher. And yet it sold more copies than the than the than the um big five published, you know, than the mass published books I wrote. And it's the book that I still get the most emails about every single day. Um, because every day there is somebody who wants to quit drinking or is living with somebody who is trying to quit drinking. They go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I have no issues with Alcoholics Anonymous as an organization. It didn't work for me for a variety of reasons that I wrote about. And it clearly doesn't work for a lot of other people too, because they write to me and say, I was lost. I tried what everything people told me um, to do and it, it didn't work. And so this book though told me there was another way. And even if my specific advice didn't help, my specific experience wasn't really, wasn't relevant to them. The message that they could find a different path to sobriety, I know from my emails, has helped a, a huge number of people get sober. So if, you, if you're if thinking about your memoir, if you're thinking about your specific story you're trying to write, um, and, and, you, um, and you pass it through those, um, those three tests of, you know, is there a focus, a specific focus on what the memoir, what the specific uh, story is trying, I'm trying to tell is? It's not just the whole story of my life, unless you are... A massive celebrity in which case thank you for coming to my webinar um michael lewis um is it relatable and applicable to a large number of people is it some is your story a good avatar for others um other stories and other struggles and then the third the question is can it either directly by specifically giving good advice or indirectly by by giving people support and an understanding of, of the world that will help them navigate their own 
Can it help people? If you say yes to those three things, then you're you're on a very, very good path to having a, a, a commercially successful memoir. Now, I should say that doesn't mean, and by the way, if you are, if you said, well, no, but I have a lot of YouTube followers or no, but I have a lot of Twitter followers, you are probably not on a path to a, a successful memoir. Now, you, you may have a publisher dumb enough to, to see that number of Twitter followers and take a roll of the dice, um, but, we, but there are, publishing is littered with examples of very, very famous people with very, very many millions of followers who got big memoir deals and publishing deals and sold so few copies, it's, it's, it's laughable. So if you can answer yes to those other three questions, though, you are on to uh, a, a very good start. Okay, so now I want to move, and, and Martin has a little swooshy thing that's going to come along. Oh, I want to talk about why you are the one to write this memoir, because this is the other very, very key point. You can answer all three of those other questions, but you st but then the next question you have to ask yourself is, am I the right person to write this memoir? And this is actually where um, I recently moved from nonfiction to fiction, and this is where I started to realize um, there are lots of overlaps with with uh, fiction writing and writing novels uh, with memoir. Because one of the first questions you find yourself asking when you write a novel, if any of you have written novels, and if you have, congratulations, it's really hard. Um, but if you've written novels, one of the first thing you'll, you'll find yourself trying to figure out is who should my protagonist be? And the reason you think that is because you you know what story you want to tell, maybe. You probably know where you want to set it but you need somebody to guide your reader through the story and, and somebody who your reader can identify with as the, as the sort of primary protagonist of your story. And I, I, for my memoir and I, oh, sorry, for my novel, and I know a lot of people, novelists, other novelists do, um, I spent a long time on this. I'm, my novel was about um, Silicon Valley, um, awful, awful Silicon Valley tech bros and the horrible things they do. Um, and a, uh, it's, a, it's a murder mystery, a thriller, and it's uh, about a serial killer who appears to be targeting some of the worst, most toxic predatory tech bros. And my protagonist, I knew I needed somebody who understood the awfulness of Silicon Valley, but wasn't necessarily so enmeshed in it that they, had, um, that they were in denial about it, um, but could sort of pass through that world and could, could get into places where others couldn't. And there's a reason why so many people choose as their protagonists in novels, journalists and writers. And lo and behold, I realized mine should also be a, a female journalist who was about to quit because of all the toxicity. And suddenly this person is killing all of these toxic tech bros. And she is found, finds herself in this struggle of, on the one hand, she's a reporter. She's somebody who's supposed to fight for truth and justice and, and you know, the <laughs> American way, maybe. Um, but on the other hand, she kind of goes, good, glad somebody's killing him. I, I tried to take him down and it wasn't working. And so this sort of, this mem uh, this this protagonist who was torn between those two worlds, I, I wrote, I created this character, uh, Lou McCarthy, who 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 I knew could tell my, did my story I wanted to tell. The exact same um, question needs to be asked by every memoirist. It is not good enough to go, well, it was me that this thing happened to, therefore I am the person to write that story. In some cases, that's true. If you're if you're involved in a world changing event and that involved three people, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a, a bad thing or a good thing that, that involved a small number of people and you were one of them, then you're pretty much the person to write this memoir. Nobody's going to say to you, oh, yes, but why is your your telling of that kidnapping relevant, like, obviously. But for most people, for the reasons I just outlined, uh, outlined there's lots of different people who could tell the story of quitting um, drinking without AA. There's lots of people who could tell the story of uh, living in luxury hotels. People do this. Um, using the hotel memoir as an example, I, I thought long and hard about this and tried to tried to think, why am I the one to tell the story of somebody giving up their house in London and um, and and going to live in luxury hotels? And and a few things. The the I, I the reason I answered my own question was. First of all, I wasn't rich. I didn't have any money. The reason I had to leave London is because I had no money. So it was about thinking, how could I do this on the meager budget that I have for my um, for my job as a as a writer, as a sort of struggling writer? How could I do it on a budget? So immediately then, if I was somebody who was rich and I wrote a book about living in hotels, no one would care. They'd say, yeah, anyone anyone who's rich can live in luxury hotels, you jerk. Um, immediately, I'm the least likable protagonist of that story. But somebody who people could relate to, 
we've all had a situation where we can't afford our rent. Most of us don't decide to give up our apartment and go and live on, in luxury hotels and in trains and planes and automobiles. Uh, the second thing is I grew up in hotels. My parents are hotel owners. Oh, they've been, <laughs> that makes me sound incredibly rich. I'm sorry. My, my parents are, were hotel managers. And then finally they, they semi-retired and bought a small hotel that they then ran for best part of a decade. And then they've now retired. But, but I spent my entire life in hotels, um, either as the son of parents who worked at quite high-end hotels, or then as, as the son of parents who were struggling to build their own uh, eventually very successful hotel. So I knew hotels inside and out. So you combine those, those things, and, and already we're starting to see potentially a good protagonist for a book about the secrets of how you too can live in hotels. Uh, but then the third thing that was unfortunately part of my character as well is, is I was still as I said about the first book, I was still an alcoholic. I was still drinking very heavily. And <clears throat> there was a, and my story was one of somebody who was clearly somebody who couldn't stay in one place, who felt that the answer to, um, to all of his problems was to run away, was to change hotels every day, was to get on a plane, get on a train. I was someone who was running away from something. I, in short, was a person, if you're writing my story as fiction, I am potentially a character that you would think, yes, this troubled, messed up loser who does this ridiculous thing but has the, the privilege, frankly, but also the knowledge to just about get away with it, is actually a relatively compelling. Um, fic would make a fictional, a good fictional protagonist. Therefore, yes, I actually think I am the best person to write this book. And so when I then came to pitch publishers with it, it wasn't just the idea. It wasn't just what I was doing. It was then all of that backstory that I knew would mean people would, I hoped at least, would mean people would follow me from from page to page to page because they would be be interested on how the character of me navigated that and um, that's another thing that i spend a lot of time working with people on when i'm when i'm helping them you know try and get an agent or get a book deal or or self-publish their book is spend a lot of time making sure you fully understand why you are the person to write this and that doesn't mean the the conclusion might be well i'm not i'm not the person to write it that's that's probably not the conclusion Rather, it's about digging deep into yourself in the same way as you would if you're writing fiction. Uh, and this is this is the beginning, probably, of my, my the sort of other thing I wanted to talk about of of what um, memoir writers can learn from uh, from fiction and from from writing uh, fiction. I, I will say, if you are already a novelist, if you already write fiction, you are already ahead of the pack here, um, because the first thing you want to do is do all of the backstory work you would have done on a fictional character on yourself. What is it about me? What do I know about my character? What are my character's flaws? And this is where memoir seems so easy because as I said, we all have lives. We can all write about them. We're all hopefully good writers. I'm sure everyone on this, on this uh, webinar is a very good writer. It feels so easy, but at the same time, that gives you this false sense of security of, yeah, I can write a memoir, easy. Just write about myself in a good way. You wouldn't do that with a with a novel. With a novel, you would start by saying, "Okay, who is my character? What is the backstory? What made them the way they are?" And you have to be, and you can be brutally honest about a fictional stranger in a way that a lot of us struggle about ourselves. To write a truly good memoir, you have to do that character work that a novelist does. Go inside yourself. What what was it about me? What was so messed up about my life that made me want to flee London? And, and go and live on the road and, and be getting into all these sort of horrible adventures, sort of many of them drunken. And then what ultimately was it that made me stop doing that? All of that has to come from a place of such brutal honesty that, that, that good memoirists are capable of doing, but a lot of new people coming to, to memoir new resist and it makes for very unsatisfying memoirs because you are not a, a likable or, or believable or engaging uh, protagonist in your own story. Um, the other lesson, moving then to to other lessons to learn from novelists, and this is sort of again a thing that that people met, sort of get wrong a lot when they confuse autobiography and memoir, is in a good novel, every single scene is doing something to drive the plot forward. That doesn't mean every scene is action, you know, uh, drama, somebody getting killed or murdered. Um, sometimes those scenes can just be very introspective. Sometimes they can be uh, watching our protagonist um, make their lunch. But in every single, even in those scenes, we are learning something about that protagonist. We are learning something about who they are. And more, excuse me, more importantly, it's something that ties into the main plot. So when in my in my novel about you know this journalist trying to understand who was murdering all these awful Silicon Valley people, even the scenes where Lou was was just 
getting ready to go out to work or she was sort of sitting at her desk, um, you know, thinking about a story, we learned about the, 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 what had made her the person she was and how that was related to the toxicity that she was about to encounter or that she had already encountered. Um, what I see too often in memoirs is, is too much, um, you know, and then I was born and then I went to school and all that good stuff, which is, but without it being tied to the main story. So somebody who does this very, very well is a friend of mine, Susan Fowler, who you might've heard of. She was one of Times People of the Year um, a few years ago as, as one of the whistleblowers. She um, she wrote uh, a blog post, a, apparently innocuous blog post that ended up blowing up the world of Uber, the, the, the toxic ride sharing company. And she wrote a memoir about her, what uh, about being the person who blew the whistle on the toxic sexist culture inside Uber that ended up with the CEO being ousted and all sorts of other um, sorts of other things. Um, but and but and she included a, a good amount about her upbringing in that story and in that memoir. But it worked because what we saw was somebody who had always she was homeschooled. She came from a very religious background. She react. She rejected all of that. She got herself into a very high end university, uh, was was a brilliant, um, brilliant engineer, uh, computer engineer. And, and her upbringing and her resistance to her upbringing told us everything we needed to know about what made her the whistleblower today. It, my upbringing as someone who grew up in hotels was relevant. I'm not saying don't talk about that, but ask her for every scene, for every fact, for every line, for every word, is this driving the story forward? If not, you might be accidentally writing autobiography, in which case, again, you're going to find it much harder to, to sell this, um, to sell this story to a publisher. It's going to make, and it's also going to make readers skip. They mean, I don't, I don't care where you went to school. Um, there are tricks you can do. Um, I, I guess I'll give one last plug for my, my course, um, which by the way, you can sign up to openbookcourse.com. If you want to sign up to the course, openbookcourse.com, uh, where I teach about how to get a book deal. I go so deep on this, on how you can, how you can make sure that your book is incredibly tight and incredibly well structured. Um, but one thing that I that I definitely recommend to, to memoirists who who do need to give backstory as to what made them uh, the person they are is you can write your book in a very nonlinear way. You can open with the scene of you being the whistleblower and bringing down Uber, or the scene of you being in the kidnapping, or you you know piloting the the uh, the oil tanker through the storm, uh, and then go back to your childhood about how it got you there. You you don't have to. Um, you can have all that stuff not at the beginning, um, but but again, my point is simply this: make sure when you are thinking about your story, you are making sure that you have got rid of any extraneous bits of it that are not relevant. Otorwise, you might have accidentally written a uh, an autobiography or a memoir. Um, I'm, I know I'm tight on time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna but I'm gonna I want to give this sort of last um, last bit of a. Uh, recommendation before we get to the, the Q&A, which is um, how to get started on this. So I've given a lot of, you know, do's and don'ts. Um, but but I want to talk about how I, as somebody who's written three memoirs, how I, um, how I run myself through those tests I just gave you of, of how to write a good memoir. So so the first thing is, I literally just asked myself those questions. Like I was, when I was thinking about writing the book about living in hotels, um, you know, I, I, I had already been a publisher by then. And so I knew a lot about what had worked and what hadn't worked. And so I asked myself, you know, what is this really about? And the first five drafts of it, of me trying to just sit with a piece of paper, say, okay, is it is it the story of this? Or is it the story of this? Uh, a technique I find very helpful is trying to write the back cover blurb of your, of your book. Um, so, uh, or even better, trying to write the summary you would say to somebody if they said, well, what's, what's your book about? Um, because you can get in a real tangle and go, well, it's a story of my life. And I guess it's really about this. And then I did this and the person's already wandered off. It's a story about my attempts to become a dot-com billionaire and failing disastrously at the age of 25. That's, that took me about a hundred different attempts of trying to say it was really a story about, you know, London. It was a story about people. It was a story about drinking. No, that's the story. A story about how I um, how I quit drinking. Sorry, how I quit London and uh, decided to and, and figured out a system for living luxury hotels uh, for for more than five years, um, and what I what I learned about the price of freedom along the way. It's not great, but but once I had that sentence locked down, then I knew I had a memoir because I knew a, a potential for a memoir because I knew who my protagonist was, me, why I was writing it. I'd done the character work. And I knew how to explain the book. So the first thing I'd recommend to anyone writing a memoir is, can you write that one sentence 
that you will that will engage people in the way that hopefully some of you were engaged by me saying that those sentences. Um, then, then you know, then you do your character work, and then the final step. And good, the good news is you have to do this anyway. Is to then do uh, is then to write the proposal. Is then to write the breakdown of what will chapter one be, what will chapter two be, what will chapter three be. What are the be the key beats to this story? Again, making sure they're all relevant to the the bigger theme you're trying to talk about. Um, many of my worst book ideas have been fortunately wiped off the planet at this stage, where I think I have a great idea, I think I have a character, I think I have a theme, I'm the one to write it, and I start doing the chapter listings, and I get to chapter four and go, and that's about it, really, I've got nothing else. So that, um, fortunately, and, and I am definitely don't have time on this, um, on this webinar to talk about the publishing process, but anyone who's ever pitched to an agent or to a publisher will know, for nonfiction, for memoir, you are going to have to do that anyway. You're going to have to write a sample chapter and then a breakdown of the rest of the chapters. So doing that early in the process is a great way to filter out, does this have the steam to be a memoir? Um, okay, I've talked nonstop for a good amount of time um, and we're about at the point where Martin said I should pause for, for Q&A. So given that, I'm gonna pause for Q&A um, and, uh, and see if anybody wants me to dig deep at anything and if anybody's even still here listening, who knows? Oh, we've got Am plenty of people. There's still <laughs> 660 people on here. And uh, 202 Lord. likes. The like train slowed down towards the end. But if you enjoyed the presentation... I, I, that happens with me, frankly. A couple of minutes <laughs> in, and people, the like train goes off the rails. And the dislike uh, train falls into the station. But, but that was uh, fantastic. Uh, folks, uh, if you're there, we'll stick around for a Q&A. So do send in your questions. Uh, we have some people throwing in uh, their, uh, their sort of... Uh, Sort of concepts and share them. Oh, here. I want to hear some of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I said earlier on, if you, I'd love to hear some of your your stories. It's it's it's. I, I so enjoy this. How I overcame multiple amnesias. How it changed my life for the better. And how you, and can help you now as you encounter memory problems. This is, I mean, right there. I mean, first of all, multiple amnesias is already wow. I, I'm, you know, and it's a bit like uh, what I was saying about you know engaging, finding an engaging protagonist is when you hear about the protagonist, you're like, I want to know more about this person. Like somebody who had multiple amnesias, we're all starting to, everybody I'm sure of the 660 odd people on this are starting to think, what must that be like? What caused that? I, how would I deal with multiple amnesias? I think it terrifies a lot of people, the idea of, of amnesia. So I think already you've got a compelling protagonist and a, and a good answer to the question of why you should be the one writing this. But then, as I said, you've got somebody who you, you, this memory problems are things that affect, I would say, all of us. Um, we may not all have multiple amnesias, but what somebody who has suffered with the most extreme type of memory loss can teach those of us as we get older. I mean, I'm in my 40s, so I'm not going to pretend that that I can relate to to some of the sort of real memory issues that people deal with. But but I, we've all had relatives, and we maybe we've been people who have suffered with with real memory issues as we get older. And knowing how somebody who had that forced upon them um, survived is, is is a fantastic idea for a memoir. So it fits all of them. Um, as Susan says, you know, how I overcame a traumatic injury and, to, and how to navigate an anti-disabled world. This anti-disabled world piece of it is, is I think, something that is so interesting. And I think, fortunately, hopefully the world is, is I mean, Susan would know, but, but hopefully the world is, if not getting better, because it is still, I suspect, an anti-disabled world, we are at least getting increasing to a point where we're understanding this is a conversation we need to have, which is a baby step of a baby step of a baby step. I understand that. But but I do think people, any memoir that meets people at a time when they're thinking, how can I do better? Because I am very privileged in almost every, in every way. And I'm very aware of that privilege. And so I really enjoy reading, enjoy my, the right word. I, I grab memoirs that help me understand my privilege better um, and help me understand how I can be a better supporter of people who are, who do not have the privileges and advantages I have, or people who have different experiences in the world. And I think memoirs that, that tell, that tell us how to be better allies to people are, are just fantastic. So, um, you know, a memoir like Susan's describing that can help people who are, who have also suffered traumatic injuries, maybe were also maybe people who were born with disabilities, um, who can help those the, the people who have experienced that, but also then a memoir for the rest of us to understand how we can be better. It, it, I, you know, I don't want to think in naked commercial terms, but that is why we're all here. And that checks so many boxes for a publisher of like, yes, a, a compelling protagonist telling a story that we all need to hear. So yes. 
Okay, we have a question here that a lot of people were asking throughout. They want, uh, they'd love for you to repeat uh, your three questions from the. Oh, uh, that you the... that you need to ask that you need to ask yourself. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. So, um, the, and assuming if if this isn't what you meant, um, uh, stars on the horizon, please tell me. But um, I I said the sort of three tests you want to ask yourself um, when you're thinking about if your memoir is is going to be com commercially viable, potentially commercially successful, is what is the focus of the memoir? What is the focus of the story? Because just a story of somebody's life beginning to end, unless they are world famous, and even then maybe not that isn't going to make a compelling for a publisher or a reader make a compelling memoir what is the focus is it what slice of your life and your lived experience is it that you are that you are that you want to talk about uh the second then is that relatable uh how is that relatable to to others i guess there's four questions actually one of them is how is that relatable to others and then you can stick on to that how will it help others it isn't good enough to just write a story um that that has a great focus if in memoir it isn't relatable to 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 other readers, if it can't help them with their experience in their lives, um, and then uh, the third one was um, how, why are you the person to write it? What is it about your experience? And this is where you have to dig deep into yourself. It isn't about you're not allowed to write this story. It's about what is it about you as a human that makes you the most compelling narrator for this specific story about this specific thing. And those are the three tests I would go through before I even thought about pitching to a publisher or an agent, because they're going to be asking those questions. And um, uh, yeah, so that those I, I believe are the three three questions that I, I think I that's uh, exactly what people are asking for. Here's a question good, 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 good. from from Mary that I'm going to expand to cover a lot of the other questions. Uh, how many chapters should a memoir be? She asked. A lot of people are asking for word counts. Is yeah, that sort of a standard I, I, expectation? No, I love these. I love questions like this because I obsess about them as well. I, I um, one of my favorite things about writing a book, writing, um, writing each new book is that I immediately realize that I know nothing about writing books. As in, every time I write, every time I write a book and then start on the next one, I'm like, I've forgotten everything, and so I panic and I start to think, is this book I'm writing even a book? Is this long enough? Is this written? And when I wrote my first uh, novel, I spent so much time looking up word counts and everything else. So it's a very good question, and it's one we all ask. Um, with memoir, honestly, the, the there is no there is no perfect answer to this. Uh, there are many memoirs that are that are very short um, because they are uh, they are trying to give people advice and information very succinctly, and it's um, uh, and so the the form lends to, you know the sorry the the message allows a 40,000 word, 30,000 word memoir. That's rare. Mine, I believe both of mine were 90,000, um, which is somewhere between 80 and 90,000, um, which, which is, you know, not dissimilar to the, the, the length of a, of a novel, of a, you know, an average novel. Um, and I think certainly anywhere sort of dancing around that sort of magic 80 to 90,000 number, you're not going to be immediately rejected by a publisher. Uh, you go much less than that or much more than that, and you might find publishers saying, this is a bit too long for us, or this is not quite enough material. If it's too, if it's much shorter than that, then you might, you might go back to that thing I said of, of trying to write out the chapter list and asking yourself why, um, why, why it's not, um, why you haven't got more to write. Uh, in terms of chapters, though, that is completely up for grabs. I have read memoirs where it's written in these incredible, very short, almost poetic uh, chapters that are, you know, uh, half a page long. And so you might have a hundred chapters in a book and that's fine. Equally, I've seen memoirs that are divided into half. It's like book one, book two, stuck together with almost no chapter breaks. The, that, the, to answer the question about how many chapters a memoir should be, I, I would more go back to the question of what, what story am I trying to tell and how should I tell it? So with my book about living in hotels, it made sense to divide each uh, section into a different hotel I had stayed in. And so each chapter became that. So it was defined by the story in that way. Um, with 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 um, my my book on quitting without AA, um, it was I broke it up into steps, much like a sort of twelve step program. So I would I would spend time thinking about what the stories you're trying to tell, and then use your sort of writerly instincts to think: Is this something that I um, should be very short, pithy chapters, or is this something where there's so much to say about each of these that it's actually a book of five or six? much longer chapters this i will say if you're if you're self-publishing this is obviously something that you can 
work with a developmental editor and they'll, they'll be able to help you with, I'm sure you can find many on Readsy. Um, but uh, if you're working with a, a traditional, more traditional agent or publisher, they will be able to give you some guidance on that and say, you know, yeah, I like this, but I would be breaking up the chapters more. I don't think getting that wrong, I don't think getting the number of chapters wrong when you pitch a novel, oh, sorry, pitch a memoir is going gonna, is gonna to cause you any problems and a good agent will guide you on fixing that. Uh, Hope that answers your question. That's great. We've got a load of questions, so I'm going to try to rattle okay. through a few of them. And I'll, I'll give shorter answers, I'm sorry. <laughs> and come them together. There's a, here's Donna. How do you get around family members who may not agree with your memoir to avoid conflict? Similarly, Gabrielle asks, when is it best to novelize rather than tell all and risk liability? I love that you are saying, I had written at the bottom, should I write as fiction? And I didn't get a chance to get to it. So thank you both for teeing me up because because there's actually two two questions that have a similar answer. A lot of people who write memoir get very, very concerned about how people written about in their memoirs will react and for good reason. Um, and then other people say, ah, but my solution to it is I'm going to write this as uh, as fiction. Uh, I'm going to write it, I'm going to pretend it's not a memoir. I'm going to write it as fiction. Don't do that. <laughs> this would be my solid advice. Don't do that. And I'll, I'll explain why. So first of all, if you are writing memoir, you are writing memoir. And the rules of memoir are as in the, um, wh when you tell people that this is a true story, they approach that fact with different expectations and different rules than if you say this is a work of fiction. And actually, you get away with a lot more, oddly enough, when you write nonfiction, when you write memoir. Because with memoir, you don't have to convince people that something would happen if it did happen. And I realized this very early on uh, when I first started writing my first you know, novel after writing a lot of memoir was I had all these characters that I wanted to, to write about who were based on people in the real world uh, in Silicon Valley who I've actually encountered. Some of them did make it into the book, but what? But none of them made it into the book exactly as they are or even close to exactly as they are. Because when I put those characters in, every one of my early readers said, I didn't believe that guy. I didn't believe that guy would really do that horrible thing. And I said, well, no, the funny thing is that guy did do that horrible thing. It's that guy over there. He really did do that. And people go, yeah, I didn't buy it. I didn't believe it. Because in fiction, you have to convince people that a, in a world as they understand it, people would do a certain thing. You hear people say this about politicians all the time. Uh, if you wrote him as fiction, no one would believe him. In memoir, people believe it because you're saying it happened and it's true and they will believe you. If you try though to write memoir as fiction, it won't feel real. And similarly, if you try to fictionalize your memoir, all of the people you're worried about upsetting will still know it's them and they'll still be just as mad at you. Um, you'll just lose a bunch of readers because they won't believe that that person is really real. So that's why I say don't if, don't novelize your memoir. It just it's a totally different skill. It's a totally different type of story. Even if some of the work you do on it is similar in terms of picking a protagonist, etc. Um, in terms of upsetting people, yes, writing memoirs are hard because you will if you do it well. If you go deep inside yourself and you pull out all the trauma and all the the, the baggage, that is going to impact other people. If you are concerned about hurting good people, then don't write that memoir because you will hurt them. I, I, I wish I had better advice to you. I wish there was some magic switch you could flick of, well, you won't hurt people. If you're worried about hurting bad people, again, same, same applies. Think about it. Think about what the impact will be. I, I've written memoirs that had real people in them. And what I did was I spoke to those people and I said, these are the stories I'm going to tell. And this is a memoir that is mostly, in all of my memoirs, the main person who was terrible in my stories was me. And I was comfortable making myself look bad on a, sta on a wider stage. Go to the people you are worried about writing about and say to them, I want to tell this story about my drinking, but I know that you were involved in my life during that time. And I know I hurt you. And, uh, you know, for example, and I want you to, I want to know if you're okay with me writing this. And if you're not, then how can I make you okay? And if not, I won't do it. Or you say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to lose a bunch of friends and that's okay. That's perfectly fine too. A lot of memoirists upset family members, upset friends, and they take the approach of, well, they knew who I was when they got to know me. That's okay too. That's your decision. But but I want everyone reading this to understand or hearing this to understand, you will hurt people. You will hurt people. Um, if you make them look bad in print, there isn't a way around that. And you need to be okay with that, or you need to talk to them, or you need to not write the memoir. Uh, like people getting blindsided by this after the fact of going, I know I wrote my memoir and I never really thought it would get published. And I never thought anyone would ever read it. They will read it. Their friends will read it. 
And maybe all they'll say to you, I had people in my memoirs who just said to me, just do me a favor and don't put my last name in. You can call me Jenny, but don't say Jenny whatever. You know, you can call me Susan, but don't say my actual full name or where I work. Other people said, don't put my name in. Other people said, can you mix me with another character? And I then always made clear this is a composite of two different people. You can navigate this, but but do navigate it. Don't ignore it. Um, and then in terms of liability, in terms of legal liability, sorry, this is not a short answer, legal liability, though, but it is probably the most important thing about memoir. Um, legal liability, if you've got a publisher, they will guide you when there's some legal liability. Um, they will guide you and say, we need to check about this because this is potentially a dangerous thing. If you're self-publishing, this is where I would be very, very careful because the buck stops with you. It may be worth you paying a, a, a lawyer, finding a lawyer who specializes in reading libel reading it's called like reading books and, and identifying potentially risky things i'm not a lawyer so i would urge you to find one if you're worried about that and you're self-publishing okay that was a very long answer martin i apologize no worries uh, i want to get to a couple more before we wrap up but just want to get some quick plugs in uh you mentioned of course re book proposals there, is, there are the details in the uh video description below paul if you want to give the quick elevator pitch of it Yes, it's a very quickly. It's a uh, it's an, uh, an eight week course. Uh, openbookcourse.com, openbookcourse.com, um, where we are apparently down there. Where uh, yeah, I basically go through everything you need to know, like twenty years of doing this, of how to self publish and how to get a traditional book deal and everything in between. If you have a book that you have in mind or you've already written or you're writing, you want to get it published um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, uh, we have amazing guest speakers, amazing guest um, authors and publishers and agents and people. Openbookcourse.com. That's my plug. Cool. Uh, and also to quickly plug Readsy, people are talking about uh, finding editors to help them uh, on their memoir. We, of course, are a marketplace where you can uh, hook up with plenty of great uh, editors, many, many of whom have worked on best-selling memoirs or uh, successful cult memoirs. Just head on there, put in memoirs as your genre, editing, and you can get folks to help you sort of guide the structure while you're writing, everything down to copy editing and proofreading. So uh, sign up for I, I used, I used um, Readsy to find the uh, a lot of people for my for my novel that I self-publish, and it got a starred review in Publishers Weekly. So that's a good ad for Readsy, I think. Yeah. Um, thank you to my Readsy sourced editor <laughs> for, uh, for saving me from disaster. Um, so yes, Readsy, Readsy, Readsy. Uh, we have a question here that... Uh, uh, Leslie asks, as someone who's worked with both an agent and an independent publisher as your path to publication, would you say one path over the other is preferable to seek? Well, I love the phrase. No, I, I've worked with all three. In fact, I've done independent publishers. Uh, sorry, I've done like small indie publishers who are traditional publishers, big publishers and self-publishing, all three of those pathways. No, it depends on the book. Um, memoir, for my two memoirs, it was big publishers. They did great. I love my big publishers. Uh, the indie publisher took a chance on the... Um, on the book about quitting without AA and it was the best selling book I've done. And then the best reviewed book I've done was my self published novel because nobody wanted to publish it. I couldn't find an agent, couldn't find a publisher. Uh, I thought it was going to, I thought it was good and I published it and then it got a starred review and all the rest of it and, and sold a bunch of copies. And now I do have an agent and now it's being published by Penguin Random House around the world. Um, it's so yeah, it, 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 you can take whichever path and it can still end up in where you didn't expect it. It's really about, um, I always recommend trying to find an agent because why not, um, you know, find an agent for something. If you find a great agent, they will save you a lot of work and maybe get you a lot of money. But I have self-published and I love it. And I love, love, love uh, my experience self-publishing a novel. So no, uh, but if you take openbookcourse.com, we go through this exact question of how to know how your book should be published. Also, if, <laughs> if you head to uh, the Readsy Live homepage, Paul did a webinar for us last year that was precisely about that. I did. I did. I forgot about that <laughs> briefly. It was, it was fun. Yeah, it was um, great. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, go and check that one out. Uh, here's more a quick one that's about sort of writing logistics. How do you avoid using I constantly in a memoir? Um, you don't. It's a memoir. It's got like me is in the word memoir. Um, I uh, I mean, I think, you know, I'm not to be flippant, but but people expect when you write a memoir that it's about you and it's written in, in the first person generally. So uh, don't don't lose sleep over it. But but from a purely writing as somebody who's been a writer for a lot of years, um, you know, yeah, obviously you want to make the language as compelling as possible and you don't want to just start every sentence. I did this. I did that. Um, so I would always encourage people to um, to to mix up their writing and to to be sort of artful in word choices. 
but if uh, avoiding talking about yourself in a memoir is 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 a bit like avoiding eggs in an omelet uh, i wouldn't worry about it too much um, yeah it's well, uh, I want to read about you, so yeah. that's from, I. From a technical writing point of view, I know it could be a bit like that, but I think there is a difference. I know some people who, whenever they write in the first person, insist on filtering everything. I saw him walk through the door, then I saw him put the cup down. Yeah. Where, where... No, start a good. I, I was just looking. I was just grabbing a, a random page in my uh, in in and bringing nothing to the party. And there's only on well, this page is only one sentence that begins with I. Um, and I, you know, the opening line to this chapter is a confession. And then I went to something else. And then another line is a, another paragraph opens with a quote from someone else. Um, and then I said, in what turned out to be, uh, you know, so there's lots of ways to avoid the the, the, the first person, uh, the I. But again, I would just, I would recommend just reading a lot of other memoirs and see how those authors do it. Because, um, because yeah, you don't just want a list of things you did. You can, that's, that's a list. Uh, Peter Schweiger asks, how do I turn my daily diary into a memoir? It goes back to 1981 as I ran a firm making custom footwear for those usually with foot and leg problems in London. So I guess it's like he's got absolute decades worth of raw material that he's looking to share. And this is him. where, yes, and this is this is a good example of where, you know, it's, it's going back to that initial question of what is the story you want to tell? Because a diary of, uh, from, from 1981 to today, my goodness, how much has happened in the world in those dates and how much will you have seen? And... Uh, but it sounds like you know the 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 beginning point here is this this uh, running this company making custom footwear. Um, you know what is the story inside that you want to tell? What is it about that experience running that company? What did that teach you about the world, and how might that resonate with other people? Is it a is it a book about entrepreneurship? Is it a book about how the business world has changed from the eighties to today? Is it a book about making a company that that helps people with with health issues? identifying and then and then again going back to that other one of my three questions of why are you the person to write this because lots of people have run companies in that 40 year span but what is it about your story about your company and about you that makes you the person to tell this story so i would almost say everything i've said up until this point is is very applicable to this so it sounds inherently it sounds interesting it sounds like you you've probably and you've i'm sure seen a huge amount of and daily diaries are obviously the memoirist's dream. You know, are we all anyone who doesn't write a daily diary, including myself, looks to people who have with such envy of like, man, I wish I had all that detail. I wish I hadn't forgotten so much, especially as a former alcoholic. I've forgotten more than I remember. So um, I envy you, Peter. But but I would say, look, you know, go back and watch the video again and think, you know, and look at all those questions of like, what is the story I'm trying to tell? How is it going to help people? And why am I the one to tell it? Uh, okay, one last one from Kira Higgs. Paul, was it hard to have editors mess with your voice? How do you feel about giving up the IP? Uh, giving up the IP, I don't care about at all. If, if, you, if you don't want to give up the IP, you can self-publish, but also you keep the copyright in your work, even with, with, with publishers. So I never really felt I was giving up anything um, in terms of like the actual ownership of my words. They are still my words. And I'm really just giving a publisher the rights to, to sell those words and I get a cut. If I don't want to do that, I can self-publish. The, the other bit of the question, though, was it was hard. Yes, um, a good editor will not mess with your voice too much because they are, it is, especially in memoir, it is your story. But I did have with my uh, book about quitting, uh, quitting drinking with that AA, I did have a number of, um, I had my, the editor I had who, had who had edited for like the New Yorker and like huge publications, um, I had so many running battles with her on just words I would not use. And one of them was got versus gotten. And any Brits will, you, Americans use the word gotten in a way that, G-O-T-T-E-N, in a way that Brits tend to use the word got. And it sounds so silly, but the, my, my editor was fixated with changing every time I said, I, I, you know, I'd got this or whatever, to I'd gotten. And I said, I wouldn't say that. That isn't me. That isn't my voice. It's so trivial. But, but there is something about having an editor tell you that your own way you speak is not how you speak that is infuriating. All I would say about it is, is good editors will listen to you and they will understand the story you're trying to tell and they will not, they certainly shouldn't be messing with your truth. They shouldn't be messing with the, the things that happened, but they will generally try to understand and respect your own unique voice because otherwise, why are they publishing you and not someone else? But that said, there is a bit where you do need to swallow it sometimes and say, you know what? Am I really, is this the hill I'm going to die on, got versus gotten, when, you know, I'm allowed to write everything else I want? So sometimes it is just take a deep breath, put your ego on a shelf and say, okay, I understand why you're saying this. And I understand it would be jarring to the majority of Americans reading this. 
I'll that ship itself. And then lo and behold, I've now been living in the US for nearly 15 years and I'd probably say gotten anyway. So they, they were right in the end anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, I should say last thing, if anybody didn't get a chance to answer their question or if anyone wants to know more about the course or me or anything else, um, I'm, I'm always happy with people emailing me directly. Paul at paulbradleycar.com is my email address. I can't promise I'll reply to you super quickly because I tend to then get swamped with emails. But if you, if I didn't get to your question or if you didn't want to ask it publicly, paul at paulbradleycar.com, I would love to hear from you um, cool. at, at any time. Fantastic. And I'll try and reply, I promise. I've just put that in the comments. Uh, however, also, if you'd like to continue the conversation with your fellow attendees, we have a link to our Discord, both uh, in the video description and at the top of the chat box. Uh, I'll be hanging out there for a little bit, so uh, if you want to say hi, drop on by. Uh, Paul, I want to thank you so much. Once again, uh, in the comments, have a look at Paul's course. It's coming up uh, very soon. I uh, hope we can have you back again at some point. Uh, any any last thoughts to leave uh, no, to just, the crowd on? Just just to, to echo what you've said about, uh, you know, I, Readsy is a fantastic platform that, that, ne that makes it easier than ever to publish books that publishers have, you know, that, that maybe publishers would miss out on and get more books in the world. So I'm a huge fan of Readsy and I appreciate you doing this. And then openbookcourse.com, I should get one more plug in for my, my course. It starts beginning of August, so I'd love to see any of you on that. But otherwise, I've been, it's such a privilege to do this and I'm always happy to come back. Great. All right. See you all on Discord. Thank you. We're going to have another one, uh, another Reedsy Live in a few weeks. Hope to see many of you there. Goodbye. Thanks, Mark.